Welcome to this edition of Rattling the Boss. I'm Manson Moves, the co-host with Eddie Conway. First, let's report on Eddie Conway. Eddie Conway is doing great. We expect to have Eddie Conway home either in July or early August. And hopefully he'll be back in this space or making a contribution in some shape, form, or fashion. When we think about the prison industrial complex and all the problems that's associated with it, we've explored a multiple things that goes on with it. But here today to talk about one of the most draconian policies to come out in the past year is Molly Hagan. And she's going to talk about the restrictions or the change in the prison policy to allow prisoners' families to provide fresh vegetables and foods for prisoners in the New York State prison. And we want to acknowledge right out the gate that we recognize, and we did a series on this about food and the type of foods that's being served to prisoners and, their fa- and, and the fact that there's no nutritional value whatsoever to them. Any effort to provide nutrition outside of the commissary, which very rarely provides any type of nutritional value, it should be supported. But here to talk about this is Molly. Molly works at, as a creative writer. She's in New York City. Molly, introduce yourself to the Rattling the Bars viewers. Hi, I'm Molly Hagan. Uh, thanks, Mesa. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm Molly Hagan, and I wrote a piece about New York State's new prison package policy for the appeal. All right, now let's let's just, just jump right into it. All right, prior to now, this this is the background. Mm-hmm. New York recently came up with a repeal of a policy where it allowed prisoners' families to provide fresh vegetables and other fresh nutritional value foods to prisoners uh, at no cost to the Department of Correction, at no cost to the state of New York, but money's coming out of their pocket. And they had a system that they was going through to check and make sure that they met the requirements. And the requirements, being like all things within the prison industrial complex, is rigid. So they was able to overcome like the rigidity of the policy. But they came up with this policy. Now, prior to them coming up with this policy, to your knowledge, how long had this package pro- program been in existence, to your knowledge? Uh, well, the policy, the new policy was announced in late April. So previous to May of this year, um, People in prison were allowed to receive two packages of food totaling 35 pounds every month. And under these new rules that went into effect uh, at some facilities in New York State in May, uh, they can't receive any fresh food packages from family and friends. All packages have to come through third-party vendors. uh, And they can only, on top of that, they're only allowed two non-food packages every year. And, and, and in terms of the, uh, the, the, the allowance, how was this received by the prison population throughout the New York State? I, I mean, I, I think there was a lot of alarm. I mean, I was getting emails um, from women at Bedford Hills. Um, I think there was also, I think the alarm also came from the fact that uh, New York State tried to put through a similar policy in 2018. Um, And there's some interesting relationship between these two policies. In 2018, uh, New York State tried to say families families and, you know, support systems, people who communicate with people people on the inside, couldn't send any packages at all and further had to go through a list of six approved vendors. And so there was an outcry. You know, when that, that policy was instated, um, I think a lot of groups found a way to organize against it because it was very, it was very directly benefiting six specific companies, mm-hmm. including, you know, union supply, like major corporations in the prison industry. And um, there were a lot of actual, like, writers groups, like Pen of America, who organized because um, the listed groups and vendors had a pretty lousy selection of books. Um, so this policy 
caused a major uproar in New York State, and then Governor Cuomo rescinded it after 10 days. Um, So I think that when I was receiving emails about this policy, they... uh, people in prison were afraid that it was just a redo of, of that policy. And, and we recognize that this, they're, they're famous for that. Let's look at, let's look at the, uh, okay, we recognize that based on what you're saying, that this food package program has been in existence at least uh, four or five years prior to them trying to get rid of it and then ultimately getting rid of it. So we, so in terms of that, uh, how cost effective was this for as far as like for the uh the system because they're providing family members are providing foods for prisoners that means that it stands a reason that if i'm getting fresh vegetables and fresh food i would no longer want need to go into the the, the dining to the uh, kitchen and that means ultimately the kitchen budget going to shrink because mm-hmm. they're going to make they're going to make the connection they're going any way they can save a penny to your knowledge, it was it was this program or has this program been successful in terms of one providing healthier foods for prisoners and two uh, helping prisoners' families maintain a relationship between them and their fat loved ones? You're talking you're talking about the two pa- food packages every yes. month, right? Uh, I think I think it was. Uh, an excellent policy. Everyone seemed to be very happy with it. There are groups like uh, there's a group called Sweet Freedom Farm Collective upstate, and they have a farmer's market outside of Sing Sing facility where families can come pick up free, fresh vegetables and bring them inside. I, I think people were just very, very happy with the way this policy was working. And it was the only reliable way that people in prison had any access to fresh food. Okay, so why now we in the article first? Let's let's explore this. In the article, you said that uh, the allegations that's being made as to why the policy is being changed is because they the system, the prison industrial complex, the fascists uh, are alleging that they these packages, these two food packages. Mm-hmm. Are being used to smuggle contraband into the institution, and that the, and that not only the contraband is creating a problem for security, but it's also causing uh, an uptick in violence. All right, to your knowledge, is it a correlation between these packages and what they're alleging, or is this just some arbitrary, bogus position they're taking in order to justify? taking something that's helping family members and prisoners. Right. I um uh, I have yet to see a relationship between the food packages people bring when they visit their loved one in prison and the violence and contraband issue. Um the families that I talked to uh felt very much that this policy felt like a punishment. It felt like retaliation. Some of them use the word retaliation for the new Halt Solitary Confinement Act. Um, I've, you know, corrections officers have been talking for years about uh, their frustrations with this act that will limit uh, the use of solitary confinement as punishment. And there is a sense that um, it's not directly stated in the memo, but representatives from corrections officers unions have said something to this effect, which is that they need new ways to punish people. And that when you can't put people in solitary confinement, you can, you know, deprive them of other things. Um, So I think families definitely interpret the policy that way. And then uh, what I thought was really interesting was no family member I spoke to said that, oh, you know, contraband drugs or weapons or whatever never comes through packages. They said happens extremely rarely, but they're like the idea that, that this policy banning those packages would have any, any serious effect on what's going on, on inside prisons is, is ludicrous. They're yeah. they incredulous about yeah. it. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and also we recognize from the article, and you can speak on this, is that, 
we had we had institution lockdown uh, in all of 2020 because of COVID. A lot of restrictions was on it from March of 2020 to December of 2020. And we had uh, serious limitations and restrictions on movement of uh, prisoners, their families' access to them, much less a family member coming all the way, like traveling like nearly eight hours to get to see someone, mm -hmm. and then they'd be turned away. Uh, that the overdose and violence had increased during this period. Can you speak on, on this? And, and, and is this an indication that maybe the source or the source of the contraband is primarily the guards or staff? Yeah, I mean, first I'll say that anecdotally, every family member that I talked to said the primary source of the contraband is the guards themselves. Uh, it, of course, is very difficult to find documentation that definitively proves this. But we did find that uh, in 2020, as you're saying, when uh, for most of the year, New York State prisons were closed to visitors. And then also, I will say, families I talked to during that time shifted to using third party vendors. Um, there were uh, drugs still in the prisons, which we know because of uh, officer use of Narcan rose uh, during that time. So, all right, and, and we also recognize that, and I've served 48 years in prison prior to being released. I've been out all of two years. I'm in the Merlin, I'm in the Merlin, I was in the Merlin prison system. And I can definitively say that God was bringing contraband in. This is public information. In the mm. detention center in Baltimore City, they had a, 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 a organized crime ring where the officers from the major on down was running interference for a, a, someone that was providing and issuing drugs to people. We had incidents where they closed the whole institution down and found out that the guards was the major source. So this is not something that's sure. uh, not known. But the, let's look at, let's examine the the uh, the, the cause behind the whole thing. And I, and I think that we need to flush this point out. Uh, it's a known fact that uh, the way of, the way prisons are controlled is through fear and punishment. And if they don't have, if they can't have fear and punishment, then they feel that they don't have no control. Programs are not something that they offer. This new task force, in terms of their recognition of uh, wanting to uh, have the solitary confinement unit, have you, in your knowledge, or do you know of any relation between the unions and which this this uh, uh, security group or goon squad, as we call it, this goon squad? Is there any relationship between the union, this goon squad, and some of the vendors that they're offering? Because then the alternative is that you have to use a, a, a external vendor. Wow. And in most cases, the vendors, are they monetize and they privatize uh, the services that are being offered prison, causing the prisoner's family to have to spend more money and prisoners get poor services. To your knowledge, is there a correlation between the union and this particular bill and the and the uh, uh, private industries that they're marketing for people, family members to use? Um, in this particular instance, I haven't found a correlation, but it is an open question that a lot of policies that are supported by correction officers and unions that are about safety ostensibly also benefit private companies that will come in and say, you know, if there are drug-soaked papers, like letters that are soaked in drugs coming into the prison, we'll digitize those for you so that, you know, the drugs won't come in on the paper. You can view the digital letter instead. I mean, there is that correlation that begs that question. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something I'm very interested in, but... I, there is nothing that I can definitively say that. Right, it's not far-fetched to believe that sure. uh, when you have a situation, I remember in a situation like this, I remember when uh, I was incarcerated, the former commissioner of correction, uh, once he was 
no longer the Commissioner of Correction. He had, he had created a, a, a mechanism where he could provide prisons with uh, sports, sports apparel. He had contracted with a sports apparel company mm-hmm. on the street, and he had used his network of being a former commissioner to provide sports apparel for prisoners. And when I was talking to him, he said that when he was a commissioner, he noticed that the number one thing that most of us was trying to get was tennis shoes, sweatshirts, and sports apparel. So he seen it was a mark for any open that door and created it. And so it's not far-fetched to believe that uh, sure. the unions and these private corporations have some type of uh, merge in terms of understanding, well, if you get this policy to pass, we'll support your union, make financial contributions. But let's talk about, uh, and, and like that's not, I don't believe, that's not a theory, that's an actual fact uh, that I know for a fact based on my own personal experience and based on the fact that we found out that the telephone companies that was being used for providing a uh, phone service for prisons was, was getting, the institution was getting 40% of the kickback from the service. So mm-hmm. it's not unrealistic to believe that this policy is it's a premeditated on the part of the uh, union to get this yeah. reversed so they can maintain a healthy relationship with corporate America that's benefiting from the prison industrial complex. But let's talk about uh, what can be done or what some of the things that you think that can be done to try to educate and try to change or reverse this policy because this policy uh, as it exists now is only further repressing people and new- and we already recognize that we're that prisoners are not getting no nutritional value foods right. while they're in constant. We we recognize that that so what can we what what are some of the things that you think that should be done and can be done and, and from your own personal experience or what what people are telling you that you're networking with that's incarcerated? Well, um, what I can say is that uh, there is some investigation into this, some political investigation into the new policy, questions about who exactly the Prison Violence Task Force is. Uh, I tried to get the physical document of recommendations that recommended this policy, and, and there isn't one. Um, so I think to kind of dig into those things, because what really frustrates me about this policy is that what I'm hearing from people inside is that not only will this policy limit and in some cases wipe out their connection to fresh food, it will also make the problems that are in the prisons worse. Like, like you know, I'm hearing it's like there, there is drug abuse, there, there is violence, but what that speaks to is deprivation and punishment. And the answer, you know, is the answer more deprivation and punishment. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's a question that needs to be asked. And then also, I think people need to understand that when an individual is incarcerated, you're also incarcerating a family and a support network and whole communities are, are drained of wealth. And they're, um, you know, I talked to a guy who just got out of prison. I think he served about 12 years. Um, He's studying to become a nutritionist and he's saying, you know, it's like we're, we're looking at generational health problems that come from the nutrition of the poor nutrition of the food in prison. So it's like it's about food, but it's about so much more. And the policy affects people outside the prison walls. And, and, that's, a, and that's a good point that you raised earlier that uh, and I know this from my own personal experience when they uh, restricted and took uh, certain things that we were allowed, was allowed to get, it created a more hostile prison environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what are some of, in, in terms of the, the things that they're alleging that's problematic, mm-hmm. uh, f- that's coming from, allegedly from these packages coming in drugs and violence, uh, what are some of the things that the system is doing to, to prevent, okay, now you, you still got violence and you still got drugs, you don't have a package. Mm-hmm. What are, what are some, to your knowledge, what are some of the things that they're doing to deal with the real issue as opposed to uh, band-aiding right. the problem? What are, to your knowledge, are they, are they providing like uh, programs that deal with uh, helping people uh, understand their disease of addiction and, and giving them alternatives? Are they, do they have alternative to violent uh, groups? Are they providing like 
the mechanism uh, to take away the pressures that people be feeling from not having no money or not having the ability to provide for themselves? Are they creating things of these natures? Not that I've heard of. Uh, when I asked that question um, to some uh, people that I talked to, I was told that the programs in prison um, are punitive themselves, which isn't helpful if you understand addiction mm -hmm. or any mental health need. Punishment is an ineffective way to uh, address it. Um, so I feel like the programs that do exist are limited in who can access them and uh, not very effective. And so it really just feels that the solution to the problem of violence, I mean, which is really, like I said, the problem of violence is really uh, you're addressing deprivation <laughs> and despair. I, I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah. Uh, the idea that more punishment would be the answer is... Yeah, more, yeah, more deprivation yeah. and despair would create yeah. a better environment uh, for everybody. And, and the right. other part, that to, like you said, you rec we recognize, in, in, as, as you stated so astutely, that this is not only it's, it's collateral damage, you have family members that's affected, but then that's the other part about it. it the prison environment don't become safe, so the staff is is mm -hmm. uh, uh, subjected to it. And not every officer that works in the prison system is brutal, hostile, and opposed to helping the prisoners like doing productive things on their behalf. But when you have these uh, Gestapo type units that uh, come to come into existence primarily to profit from the prison industrial park complex, then they become they set the tempo and the, and the repression, the deprivation that they that that comes out of these acts, only thing it does is make the prison environment much more hostile than mm -hmm. it, than it would be. And I remember that uh, uh, when I was locked up, a guy was telling one of the uh, the warden, and they would say, man, you know, when you deal with violence, we might start out uh, hurting each other, internal violence, but ultimately we turn the violence on to the oppressor. Because we recognize at some point in time, we recognize, say, oh, the reason why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling, I'm, because I'm being deprived of my basic human rights. And because I'm being deprived of my basic, I'm going to demand them. And when you do anything other than meet my demand, then I'm going to respond with violence because that's going to get my, the attention I need to get the changes. And it's not, it's, it's not by design. It's not by my interest in like being pathological. It's by me recognizing that Unless I do something about this, I'm going to die, and I'm going to die uh, a horrible death because I'm, the deprivation is going to ultimately consume me. But let's, let's and I die, and I, let me get off this uh, soapbox. And uh, let me uh, ask you this here, Molly. Uh, how do you, what do you think will ultimately result, how do we ultimately resolve this matter in terms of uh, getting the society and the public at large to really, hone in on, because we recognize that this taxpayer's dollars, this, you know, the family member, they paying for it. You know, they paying the officer's wages. They're paying for the, the existence of Sing Sing and Clinton and these other, you know, by their tax dollars. So what do you think that can be done on, from the family members in terms of trying to get these, this policy changed? And we've seen it done before. What do you think can be done at this juncture, if you have any views on that? Um. I think in terms of this particular policy, um, I'm, uh, it's tough because as I was saying about the 2018 policy, uh, there were very clear um, issues to organize around. And this policy, even though it will ultimately have the same effect, um, is is written in a more ambiguous way. So so the previous policy said you can only send packages, you, you can only buy from these six vendors. So this policy clearly is, you know, funneling money to these vendors. This policy says you can go through any vendor. You can go through any vendor you want. Um, which families argue they will ultimately end up going through places like Union Supply because those are the companies that specialize in the package restrictions. Um, 
for prison. Uh, so you have that, uh, but it's harder to, you know, bring groups on board to say specifically, definitively, this is a, a you know, further puts money in the pockets of corporations. And then also, you know, the book thing, it's like, you know, it was, it was great for, for these, for Pen of America, for large publications like the New York Times and the New Yorker to be able to headline, you know, books and education, people organized around that. This, I just, I don't think it's impossible. I just think it will be a lot more difficult. I think there's a lot of organization around the food aspect of the policy, but I do think in general, People need to understand how it touches on all the issues that the 2018 policy did. It touches right. on that prison is an industry in itself and that in many ways the person in prison is the subject of that. They're being extracted from. Um, right. And when you extract wealth from a person in prison, you're also extracting from their family. So, right. I mean, I think it's like, I, I think compelling things to people who may not be super familiar with how prison works. Um, is this idea of prison as as a larger industry beyond like a private prison that makes money in itself? State prisons in New York, ask every aspect of like communication with someone in prison. Every aspect of your life is monetized. Mm-hmm, in this way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that's really um, compelling and disturbing to people. And then also, like I said, how you're not, when you put someone in prison, you're not punishing an individual person, you're punishing families and communities, that you're really talking about webs of um, extraction, I guess. Right, and and you know what, and we recognize that uh, uh, we have a quasi-privatization of prisons, because Mm -hmm. as you outline, all the uh, support mechanisms that exist are privatized, communication, visitation, uh, yeah. the ability to send money in uh, and then these packages is, is, is not uh, unusual. I was thinking that um, have have you heard the conversation around and because we had did this in, in the state of Maryland when they when they said we had to get certain vendors uh, guys that got out and people that got out they created their own they created a business mm-hmm. and they utilized that and they tried to get and they got in some cases got approved from the Department of Correction to allow that to be one of the vendors. Have you heard the conversation around that? That maybe the, uh, and I, cause I recognize in your article, it was a lot of support groups. So have you, have that conversation been had about, okay, let's take the farmer's market. Let's do a coalition and put it together and pitch it as a, as this is an alternative, or this is a vendor that the family members want to use. And it be, and we can go right back to square one saying people give them free food. Uh, mm-hmm. Family members not being charged exorbitant amount. One is going back into keeping the cooperative alive. Have this? Have you heard a conversation about that, or is this something that you think a conversation should be held up around? Um, I have not, and I know that there. I know of at least one small company in New York that was founded by you know formerly incarcerated people. Um, I don't know if I'm not sure that would be a worthwhile direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, you know, in charge of the activism around this, but I, because I do feel that it's still extracting and it's still separating, even in good faith, is separating, is severing a connection between the person in prison and their support system. You know, I I mean, a, a lot of families talk to me about going to the grocery store or, you know, like the farmer's market and hand picking vegetables for their loved one. You know, Caroline in the article, her husband loves avocados. She loves right, to right. avocados. Like, you know, <laughs> it's like you, right. you just want to have, especially when you're separated physically, you want to be able to have some connection, some sense of normalcy of like, right, I bought right. these groceries. Um, right. And I think that's a really important aspect that people need to understand too. Um, it's not just about the money. It's another thing that isolates people in prison from the outside. For the humanizing. All right, Molly, you had the last word on this uh, subject, Brad. What, what, what would you like to close with? Um, I think I would say that I am concerned that this policy not only doesn't address 
the problems it says it's supposed to address, but will actually, might actually make these problems worse and make life inside more difficult for everybody. Um, and that, I think, is the takeaway. There you have it. The real news from Molly mm -hmm. about the repressive, inhumane treatment of prisoners in New York. Remember, Attica came out of New York, and it was because of the repressive dehumanization of the prisoners of Attica that they rebelled against those conditions. And here we are in 2022, revisiting them same inhumane and repressive conditions to the extent that they will not allow our family members to provide us with fresh foods, foods that they don't provide. It wouldn't be a need to provide fresh foods and vegetables in these days if the system was providing them. And mind you, the system is getting money for providing these things. Here we have it again, the real news about how unions, Gestapo type or units in prisons are regulating and delegating uh, policies and procedures. Continue to support uh, the efforts that's being made by the family members of the New York prison system. Uh, you can review the article that Molly wrote. There's a lot of support groups in there that you might want to look at. Uh, Molly, what's your contact information? If anybody want to contact you about it. Oh, uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, it's Molly Hagen underscore. Uh, yeah, contact me there. <laughs> we, okay. Yeah. And thank you, Molly. Uh, we really enjoyed this conversation. And hopefully yeah, uh, so the real news uh, listeners and Rally the Ball viewers will support this effort that's being made on behalf of the family members and the prisons of New York City. Uh, we ask you to continue to support the real news and continue to support Rally the Ball. If you have any in information or if you have anything that you would like us to explore or examine, just feel free to contact us at The Real News. I'm Mansa Musa, signing off, co-host with Eddie Conway, and continue to give us the support that you have been giving us. And thank you very much, Molly.